We receive tonight with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. I ask my Father tonight, you anoint me to teach truth in simple and clear language like Jesus would have done were he physically present. I ask that my listeners understand better than I teach and better than I explain in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're excited to welcome you. It's been a short break on the Sunday evening teachings, and uh, we're excited to discuss the kind of topic we discussed today. So I'm just going to go straight into it, uh, discussing money, relationships, and marriage. Let me quickly say this as the first thing I will say, that the world in which we live and we do relationship is a world that runs on money economy. So you want to understand this perspective if you are going to, you know, have the life that you dream of. And like I always say, people struggle because uh, this area is not covered. All right, so people struggle a lot when it comes to relationship and marriage and the subject of money. Also, the first thing I'll say, which I've done series on uh, in the past, available on YouTube, is to say that the money disposition of the person you hook up with is the first thing you must look at. All right, so I'm just going to extend that conversation first of all uh, and say a few things today. All right, so uh, let's take our first text from Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, 24, the Bible says, no one can serve two masters. The first thing you want to know about money is money is either a master or a servant. Everybody serves or controls money. The first thing you want to know. And now, this is not about the volume of money you have. It's about the disposition you have towards money. So you have a lot of people getting married to people who are servants to money. Now, that's a major problem. You have, you have a lot of people getting married to people who are servants to money. All right, how do you know this? You see a lot of these people, almost all their decisions in life are influenced by the need to make or have money. All right, now, we all need it, like I said, because we live in an economy that is driven by money. All right, we live in a world that you spend money to live, basically. So here's the question. Are all their decisions, all right, informed by the need to make money? Let me say this to you, the safest spouse to have is the spouse whose decision is governed by purpose. Why? When God gives a vision, for example, God begins to give provision. But for the person who chases it, that's what the Bible says in the Matthew, uh, Matthew 6.33 uh, or, or thereabout, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why is he saying seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Because if you seek the kingdom, all other things, including money, will be added. All right, so this is not saying that you should marry a lazy bone who does not, all right, know how to make money or who does not have any ambitions when it comes to money. But it says what? It says, seek ye first the kingdom. All right, because if you are able to seek the kingdom, all other things will be added. In essence, one of the things that keeps relationship or marriage stable is the capacity of the person you are dating or the person you are married to to have their focus on purpose. All right, purpose will produce money, but money will not automatically produce purpose. Now, this is why a lot of marriages are strained or a lot of relationships are strained. Why? They do not understand purpose. And now, let me quickly say this. When you begin to understand purpose, you begin to realize that the relationship and the marriage is a greater thing to focus on than making money. <laughs> ah, some people are going to look at me and say, this guy has come again. Yes. Why am I making the money? Because I will enjoy it in my marriage. All right, so that my marriage is greater than my economy. All right, because the economy is there to serve the marriage and not the marriage to serve the economy. So I'm not going to sacrifice my marriage on the altar of trying to make money. Why? The money itself should serve the purpose of the marriage. That's what we're talking about. So you want to be sure that this person you are dating or this person whose life you want to be is a person who understands that purpose is greater than money. So Jesus begins to say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. He begins to bring money within the context of the conversation of control, the conversation of servitude, the conversation of, you know, does money control the narrative of your life or the narrative of your life controls money? All right, now this is why people abandon their spouses and go pursue jobs or abandon their uh, relationships as they want to first of all blow. All right, now every time you see a person who thinks they have to give up a relationship to blow, you see a person who does not understand how God designed life to work. <laughs> 
You see, a person who doesn't understand how God desires life to work. Because God's original intention is for the relationship to be central to your life and your destiny. All right, so that money comes in, right, you know, to make it happen. So one of the things you must do for yourself, you know, one of the things you must do for yourself is to check and be sure. Check and be sure that they put money where money belongs. And let me quickly say this to single people. Anybody who can pursue money at the expense of the relationship they have with you is a discardable person. Why? Money should never rank higher than you. What are we making money for? Are we going to take money out of this world? No. If we are not taking money out of this world and money cannot serve the purpose of the relationship, then we have wrongly prioritized money. All right, so it's so important. Now, this is why a lot of people are married to people that make them sick and tired of life. Why? They are pursuing the things that are not central to life while abandoning and corrupting what is central to life. All right, so what does he go on to say here in Matthew 6, 24? He goes on to say, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Are you seeing that point? Now, when it comes to the conversation of money, relationship, and marriage, this person in your life should never despise you because of money. I'm telling you this. This person should never despise you. Now, that's why you see things happen in relationships that are amazing. And I'm going to explain a few things very quickly just to put this in clear perspective. Do you know, for instance, if you come to the point where you need to sacrifice time that you should spend with your partner, you come to the point where you have to be absent. You owe your partner an explanation. You, you, you owe your partner. See, you know, it, it's so easy in relationships to come to the point where you just feel, they should understand now. What is that? And you're getting bitter and angry. Bitter and angry over what? Getting bitter and angry. You should not be getting bitter and angry. You should come to the point where you understand that carrying them along is a responsibility you have. All right, why? Agreement is the strength of any union. So, an agreement begins from the point where you're able to sell a vision. All right, that's what the Bible says in Amos 3.3, 3, that two cannot work together until they be agreed. All right, now you cannot be agreed until you communicate. Now, you have not effectively communicated until you are understood. In essence, when it comes to your pursuit of money, or needing to make money, you need to bring your partner to the place where you are able to translate the vision of why you want to make money and how you want to make it. So don't just punish them with an ambition. You know, some people are so ambitious, or like they're in their life, or you are married to them, and their whole mind is fixed on how they want to make money. All right, that's good, that's noble. All right, but the thing you must do is you must have the capacity to communicate the vision. You must have capacity to communicate the ambition. You must have capacity to communicate the purpose. Why do you want to do the things you want to do? Why do you want to go the career path you want to go? Even the money you want to make, why do you want to make money? Why do you want to make money? All right, so that when your partner understands your purpose with the assignment, understands why you want to do the things you want to do, they will begin to adjust to the sacrifices you need to make. Now, this is where a lot of people don't get it. So, you see, one of the problems that happen is, so you wind up with trouble in the home because nobody is communicating why I'm going to be absent. You wind up with trouble in the home because nobody is communicating the nature of sacrifice my partner may have to make. I'm going to give you very straight examples. There are times I go to the office on a Sunday. I mean, that happens a lot. All right, so I need to communicate to Julia why I would be in the office. I need to communicate with Julia why a weekend that should be for rest is not exactly being for rest. All right. So people become arrogant and, and, and pompous and feel like they should understand. No, they should not understand until you communicate. All right. So this is this is basic foundational wisdom you should have when it comes to you know this issue of money. Because a lot of people have come to the point where their partners feel despised. All right, their partners feel despised. And you're wondering, you know, the, the reason why this is so full of conflict is you're wondering, I'm doing this for the family. 
Why is my wife not seeing it? I'm doing this for my wife. Why is my wife not seeing it? I'm doing this for my husband. Why is my husband not seeing it? So they become conflicted. All right, you are doing something good, but your partner is not seeing it because you have not communicated to your partner the vision behind the pursuit. So it automatically translates before you know it into abandonment or being despised. So Jesus begins to say, all right, that either he would hate the one and love the other, or he would be devoted to the one and despise the other. All right, so the despising here, you know, uh, is, is, is an emotion that a lot of married people have had to deal with. I mean, a lot of married people have had to deal with being, feeling alone, feeling, you know, abandoned, feeling like, you know, like a focus on me, and, and it's so important. All right, so the, uh, another point you note in this is the point that the pursuit, all right, to make money, get money, multiply money, is not necessarily the problem. All right, so the worship of mammon, all right, Jesus speaking in the context of mammon here, actually is tied to your uh, lack of capacity to maintain the balance of life because of the pursuit of money. All right, it's tied to your capacity, all right, to maintain the balance of life. And like I said, you do not despise your partner, all right, you find the balance by, first of all, learning to communicate, learning, you know, to pass across an information or pass across information the way they need it. All right, the other thing you have to do uh, is this. You need to allow your partner understand how they factor in the enjoyment of the money made. This is where a lot of couples struggle. You need to let your partner, and there are two ways you do it. There are two ways you do it. Way number one is you must communicate the reward of the pursuit. Way number one is you must communicate the reward of the pursuit. It's a dangerous thing when your partner cannot understand how they factor in the enjoyment of the money you want to make. Or your partner ought to be made to understand how they factor in the enjoyment of the money you want to make. That means you've got to cast vision. One of the things I do to Julia is to cast the vision of where we would live. All right? Or the kind of houses in which we would live. The kind of comfort I will provide. Or I'm the man here, come on the kind of vacations we would take, the kind of gifts I will buy for her. All right, now, the moment she's able to factor in the enjoyment, all right, once it becomes a thought in her, to factor in the enjoyment of the money I would make, all right, she begins to become more disposed to release me, all right, to make the money. All right, she begins to interpret my sacrifices differently. She begins to interpret my sacrifices differently. So it's so important. Couples must communicate reward. All right, so that they don't labor in vain. What am I talking about labor here? So that they don't, you know, survive your absence in vain. All right, so that they don't release you in vain. All right, because reward is one of the things that, you know, stretches patience. If you want your partner to suffer long, what the Bible calls long suffering, you want to come to the point where you release into them an expectation, all right, an expectation of the reward that awaits them. Even Jesus, the Bible speaking, he endured the cross because of the reward he saw. He saw you and I saved. All right, so it's so important to come to that point where you continually sell the idea of the reward that your partner stands to gain when they release you to make effort. All right, beyond the idea, the next thing you want to do is you want to make sure that your partner is a practical, historic beneficiary of your financial blooming or your financial boom. All right, so how do you do that? You need to have a track record that they indeed actually and practically enjoy your profiting. All right, so it becomes difficult when a partner sees you, you know, making all the effort sacrificing the relationship you have with them from time to time to make money they are not enjoying. So besides selling the idea, in fact, this goes with the idea so, because what happens is when they remember the great things you did for them, the last gift you got for them, the last time you used the same money to take a vacation, in essence, you did not just excuse yourself for some time to make money, or I did not just go to the sacrifice of your making money, I saw practically that there was reward in the process. 
I saw practically that there was reward in the process. What have you done? You have created a mindset in me that tells me this money that he's making, this Sunday office he's going to, this extra hour he's putting in, these meetings he needs to fly between cities to have in less than 24 hours will produce results and the mind of your partner begins to think this way. Before you know your partner, you are on a business trip and your partner is thinking of the capacity to afford the next vacation. Your partner is thinking, wow, that means a new house. Oh, that means our furniture is changing. Oh, your drop is changing. Or even when he's coming from this trip, I'm going to get a new pair of suit. I know that surprise is coming for me. I know every time she travels like this and gets extra code or gets extra pay or gets a professional fee or gets some form of reward, I am never left stranded. All right, now these are little tips that couples don't understand. So people get married with high expectation. Let me say this to you. There is nobody you will marry who will not have expectation on the money you will make. So the moment you begin to make money which uh, they do not see reward from, you are creating crisis. Or you are creating crisis. So they want to see reward from the money you make. They want to see how you communicate practically. Practically speaking, all right, a reward to them based on your earnings. All right, so it's so important, match to your speech, action. So that your partner sees practically that money, 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 all right, is not more valued in the relationship than them. Now, this is why a lot of romantic relationships are suffering. Now, most times your partner would not complain. And the reason they will not complain is this. They will not complain because they do not want to appear to be people who are pressing you on money's conversation. So you are more couples or partners who keep quiet and suffer silently, hoping that your partner would understand that you need to make money reward communication to me. I am your wife. I am your husband. Please communicate. And let me quickly say this, this is directed at the men. More women than I know have money as a money language. Credit her account and you will see it. I'm telling you, their reaction will tell you that money is a love language on its own. All right, so it's so important. The next point I'll make is couples need to learn to make sacrifices. Couples need to learn to make sacrifices. And I'm going to explain this very passionately. All right, sacrifices that communicate all the time that what I have or do not have does not control how I perceive you. Couples need to learn to make sacrifices. I'm going to shout that again. If you wait for the day that you have all the money to prove your love, that day may not come. All right, now here's the deal. Money or the amount of money is not the problem. The thoughtfulness of the interaction with money is what will keep your partner glued to you or not. The thoughtfulness of the handling and interaction of money. The thoughtfulness of the handling. Let me say something to you. One of the best times I give gifts to my wife is when my wife knows I'm not at my best financially. It communicates deeper than quantity. Or it communicates better than the amount of money involved. In fact, let me say this to you. Some people would not be able to communicate romance when they are rich because their partner would know that this is just excess money talking, not thoughtfulness. So it's not about the volume of the money. It's not about the availability of the money. It's about the thoughtfulness that goes into the interaction of money. If you understand that, then you are getting things in perspective. That's why you have a lot of people who are rich and their romance is down. All right, you have a lot of people who are rich and their romance is poor. Because you look at your partner and you know that my partner has money. Thoughtfulness is missing in the use of it. You know, it's only poor people that feel that money is, <laughs> money is the answer to all things. Ask people who are rich. I mean, ask people who are rich. Many of them know, practically speaking, that romance is missing. Why? The thoughtful element, the sacrificial element. And I'm going to give you some examples. It's a clear example. Now, for some rich people, vacation is not the problem. It is that you took time off your busy business schedule to have a vacation with me. Now, that's a sacrifice that is not in the amount of money, but in creating time to use available money. A lot of people don't know that. So you have a, a lot of rich fools, extremely rich, and thinking that money cuts it. 
Money cannot fill up affection. Money cannot fill up thoughtfulness. Money cannot blind that. Money cannot do that. So it becomes extremely important to appreciate that money itself is not the problem, but the sacrifice of the use of money. So for those who are not as rich as the one I just described, what are you doing? You are using your scarce or limited resources to communicate your abundant affection. So you may not have it in abundance, but you have abundant affection. Now, this is what happened when Jesus said that this woman who had just given a mite, what we call the widow's mite, had given more than all other people. Now, this was her last. This was her only amount. All right, what did she do with it? She brought it out and she gave it. All right, she brought it out and she gave it. Then Jesus looked at the other guys who were bringing out of their abundance. They were bringing from their large sums and they were taking a fraction of. Now, the fraction they took of their large sum appeared bigger in quantity than what the woman gave, but Jesus looked at her heart and said that this woman gave more than all of them. Why did she give beyond all of them? Because her thoughtfulness make, made her carry her last and gave it. So it becomes important. It becomes important to tell yourself the truth. What kind of sacrifice am I communicating with the communication of money? See, if you get this, if you come to the point where it looks like you are even manipulative, you begin to control the narrative of how your partner feels towards you. Because a lot of people do not understand that the reason their partner feels like, you know, they are bad people, they don't give, or they are not loving, is because the lack of thoughtfulness that goes into the money communication. All right, so you need to allow some degree of thoughtfulness go into the money conversation. Until you do this, you are not getting it right. All right, the other point I must make is you must be ready to contribute momentum to your partner. That is another bonding point when it comes to the conversation of money in marriage. You must be ready to contribute momentum. Now, you must not be in the same profession as your partner to motivate them. You must not be in the same profession as your partner to encourage them. So very often the husband is going through a lot of financial pressure and cannot even speak to the wife. Or the wife is going through a lot of financial stress and cannot speak to the husband. One of the greatest things you would do to make your marriage to bond appropriately is to come to the point where you become interested in your economic effort. You become interested in your economic effort. So your partner is making effort and you want to make sure that you are interested in the conversation. This is what will make you interested in the nature of their business, whether you are in that profession or not. This is what will make you interested to know about their welfare on the job. Why? They are exerting that much effort because they want to contribute to the home. They are exerting that much effort because they want to be a blessing to the family. They want to contribute their quota. They want to make sure that something comes home. So what do you want to do? You want to make sure you are always contributing some form of contribution of thought, thoughtfulness, suggestions, opinion that matter, all right, contributions in terms of, you know, just giving them moral, uh, uh, moral support. Sometimes you just tell your husband, oh my God, I see the effort you are making. I, I see the sacrifice you are making to keep this home running. Sometimes you just tell your wife, I know that I've not been able to provide all I, I, I should provide as a man. Number one, I, 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 I'm grateful for the contributions you make. Number two, I, I'm grateful for the sacrifices you make. Because there are things I know you deserve that I'm not giving right now. What are you doing? You are, you are giving a moral boost all right, to their effort. All right, you are acknowledging what they do. All right, you are acknowledging the things that they contribute in that sense. All right, so I'm just going to read a few scriptures and throw some more perspective when it comes to the money conversation and perspective that you need in every relationship or marriage going forward uh, and close to this teaching. Philippians chapter 4, 11 to 13, is a not that I speak of want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. This is another thing every couple should do if they have a good life. You must learn to be content. And now, why should you learn to be content? Contentment is rooted in being satisfied with what you have on your way to what you can have. 
all right, discontentment or lack of gratitude is being frustrated based on what you can have and refusing to enjoy what you have. All right, so it's so important as a couple to practice contentment. So Paul says, look, I'm not talking to you because I want, all right, because I, I lack, because I've learned to be content with what, uh, the things that I have. He said, I know how to get along with a humble means. I know how to get along when I don't have a car. All right, so that what we have or do not have does not corrupt the union. All right, so that what we are able to do or we are not able to do does not corrupt the union. It becomes extremely important to appreciate this conversation. So Paul says what? I know how to get along with humble means <laughs> and I know how to live in prosperity. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Now, tie this to what I began to say at the beginning. To the point where my purpose controls me, not money. My purpose defines what I do, not money. My purpose coordinates my choices. All right, not money. All right, you say, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. I mean, wow. He said, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things. I can do all things through him, that's Christ, who strengthens me. What is Paul saying here? Paul is simply telling us here, you know what? God's grace should factor through our choices or right, to bring us to the point where whether we have or we do not have, our conduct is consistent. Whether we have, now let me say this to you. This is the only way you can retain romance through every financial season. I can do all things. I can be romantic when we have. I can be romantic when we don't have. I can be romantic when the money is large. I can be romantic when the money is low. He said, I have learned to be happy at all times so that my joy towards my partner is not determined by my economic worth. Very, very important. My joy towards my partner is not determined by my economic worth. My joy is determined by my learning, all right, to be on my guard. By my learning to be on the guard, to make sure that money does not control the narrative. That brings me to Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all greed. It is greed not to be content with what you have. Don't lose sleep over what you don't have. It is greed. Now, this is the conduct you need to cultivate, both as a single and as a married person. Because until you cultivate it, you'll be a toxic partner. Until you, until you lower your greed, you'll be a toxic partner. You'll be terrible to yourself because you lose your, you lose your cool, you lose your balance, you lose your emotion, then you become toxic towards your partner. You come to the point where your partner cannot enjoy you. Now, this is the source of nagging. This is the source of an irritable personality. This is the source of a person who is not easy to get along with. This is the source of a lot of people's behavior that reveals anger. This is the source of a lot of people's disposition that is unpleasant. It becomes important to appreciate that. All right, he said, be on your guard. Now, if Jesus said be on your guard, it means you can be on your guard. What does it mean to be on your guard? He said, watch it. Look out for it. Sit back and tell yourself, of late, have I been acting content or discontent? This is not about being ambitious or not. Of late, have I been irritable because of money? Am I losing sleep over what I will soon get? Am I, am I losing character? How am I behaving? Until you come to that place of introspection, you will fall into greed without knowing. And let me say this to you. Greed is insatiable. Nothing on earth can satisfy a greedy person. So you want to tell yourself the truth. You want to come to the point where, and let me say this to you, until you arrest greed, you will have a very bad marriage. Why? You will always pursue something. Mammon will lay hold of you. Don't forget where we began in Matthew chapter 6, 24. Mammon will lay hold of you. That's where the Bible says that we're reading. You can't serve two masters at the same time. Now, greed is a master. A lot of people are serving it. All right, so you look out, no contentment. Your neighbor bought a car, you want to buy it. Somebody got a new shoe, you want to get it. Somebody's just living their own life and doing fine. You want to do fine at all costs, at the same pace and at the same level at them. That's a problem. 
That's a problem. All right, you want to watch out. So Jesus said, be on the guard. Now, he won't say to us to be on the guard if there's not something to guard against. So Jesus says, be on the guard. All right, he said, watch. In essence, put security on your heart. Put security on your heart. Now, how do you do that? You use the word of God all the time to check if you are still okay. <laughs> you need to tell yourself, am I still okay? This ambition I'm having led me to make X, Y, Z amount. Why? This, I, I want to blow, I want to blow. Why do I want to blow? What exactly is my motivation? All right, you need to check greed. So Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Are you seeing how Jesus, our Lord, is helping me tie the point I made in the first place? See, your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. What does it consist of? It consists of your purpose. That's how we appear before him. He's going to say, Ah, welcome, thou good and faithful servant. Why is he using the word servant? He's using the word servant in the context of your purpose. He will not say, Wow, welcome, dear billionaire. Oh, see this billionaire. See this zillionaire. Oh my God. Don't forget that you are dealing with the God who created all things. The Bible says, Cattle on a thousand hills are his. You can't impress him again with what you own. If what you own is not fulfilling the purpose he put you here for. That's why he's speaking like this. That's why he said, watch it. Guard your heart. Why? Your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you own. I wish couples will know this. Because you have a lot of couples losing sleep over property. This is why people are getting divorced. The whole focus is about property. The focus is about property, property, property. Who gets what? What will I lose? What is possession? What is money? Yes, we will make it. But we will make it for purpose. That's what he's saying here. So he said, guard your heart. He said, guard your heart. I'm going to take another scripture that will take us deeper. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 12. It's a bit of a long read, but to give you perspective here. What does it say? He said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. In essence, even godliness with lack of contentment is great loss. So you want to really profit, have contentment. In fact, the way to family profit is contentment. The capacity to enjoy where you are before you get where you are headed. All right? After understanding what Jesus said, your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you own, what the next thing he says here is a godliness with contentment is great gain. He said, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. We brought nothing. The only thing you are is the purpose you were given before you showed up. That is the thing you will give account for. You're not going to give account of your cars. Have you not seen billionaires die? Have you not seen millionaires die? They go into the same earth. It doesn't matter what casket they were buried in. See, any relationship and marriage that does not understand this as a foundational structure is already in trouble. All right, he said, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Food and clothing, oh my God. See how basic that sounds. He said, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. You need to get this in perspective. People who want to get rich here, he's talking about the love of money. People who just want to make money for making money's sake. All right, not people who are making money for purpose. And I'll give you an example. Purposes are very clear. Kingdom, for instance. When was the last time you supported any gospel cause? You know, I laugh at people. You know, sometimes I just see, oh, actually, you bless my life so much. Then I put account number, support what we do. For instance, the last time guy we spent some millions, man, real good money. You know, you say to some people, oh, support what we do. Then you just see, phew. You just like like a robot that just was, was turned off. Some people don't even. I mean, when, when was the last time you supported a kingdom cause? When was the last time you supported a just cause? When was the last time you thought about money outside making money, just making it? Or when was the last time, let me say this one, you thought about money outside competition? Outside buying a final car than your neighbor? Outside dressing better than your colleague? Outside showing up in church and everybody saying, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. When was the last time you thought about it that way? That's the conversation he's making here. 
It becomes important to appreciate it. He said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. If I'm going to stop this teaching on this very point today, it's the source of all kinds of evil. You want to see people doing ritual? This is it. You want to see people divorcing their wives? This is it. You want to see people divorcing their husbands? This is it. You want to see people, you know, fighting themselves? This is it. You want to see unforgiveness? This is it. You want to see malice, strife? This is it. The love of money. Issues of money. You bought this, you didn't buy that. You left me, you didn't leave me. You didn't give me. I'm contributing more in this home. I'm doing this. Shut up! The love of money. Love of money. This is why people leave their spouses, change cities in the name of work. That is worship of mammon. This is why people cannot talk to their wife because they are holding money. This is why women are doing my money, are hiding accounts. Why? They are lacking synergy. They are lacking the capacity to find themselves synergized. They are lacking the capacity to come together. Why? The love of money. The love of money. Look, let me tell you, more money in my hand will be more purpose fulfilled. More money in my hand will be Julia being the, oh my God, I will spoil her. Money is not an end in itself. Money is given to us to serve a purpose. God does not just want to prosper me just for prospering me's sake. Don't forget that rich fool who looked at himself and said, I've made it all. Ah, my soul, eat and be satisfied. God looked down from heaven and said, you fool. Angel, quench him. Off his switch. Enough of that nonsense. God was tired of hearing rubbish. God called him, told him enough. Look, money is not an end in itself. Don't damage your relationship because of money. So what should you do? You should have the capacity to synergize. All right, put money on the table and say, you know what? We are going to build a financial life together. And let me quickly say this. If you are not financially united, you are not married. You are just deceiving yourself. Because the world in which you are married runs on money economy. So if you cannot agree on what the world runs on, ah, your case is very pathetic. So he says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Any money you will make that will cost your Christianity is not of God. Any money you will make that will cost your Christianity and by implication your marriage, because the moment your faith goes, your marriage will follow. The moment your faith goes, your marriage will follow. Any money you will make that will cost you your faith will cost you your life. Any money you make, he said, because of the love of money, some have wandered from the faith. So what test is this? Any money that takes you away from growth or being grounded in Christ is not money that God wants you to have. Mm. You know people who begin to make money and cannot come to church anymore. Aha. Uh -huh. The way they treat God is the way they are treating their spouses. So it becomes important. He says some people eager for money, eager for money, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Sadly, this is waiting. You know, and let's not be pretend over it. Sadly, this is waiting for a lot of people. I mean, they'll pierce themselves with many sorrows because they'll get into things that are not convenient according to the standards of God. They'll get into things that are not convenient according to the standards of God. Now watch it. Anytime life begins to demand of you or require of you to do things that are below the standard of God, that thing is asking for your whole life, including your marriage. All right? But you, man of God, flee from all these things. Now, again, Jesus told us to be on the guard. All right? Now, the epistle here in Timothy is telling us, you know, Paul is writing here, and he's saying to us what? He said, flee from these things. That means there will be a pull at you at these things. There will be greed pulling at you. That means there will be excess ambition pulling at you. That means the capacity to worship mammon by abandoning your spouse, changing location, going on a transfer, not working as your family, being together, I mean, doing things, not talking to your partner because you feel they don't understand. You want to blow, you want to blow, you want to blow. He said, these things will pull at you. He said, but you, man of God, flee. Run from them. Put yourself in check. Put yourself in reminder. All right? He said, but you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? Making money the right way. <laughs> That's what righteousness is. Making money the right way is righteousness. In essence, I am not betraying any spiritual, faith, family, principle because I want to make money. 
Ah, let's not even go into the deeper dimension. That means I'm not committing any sin for the sake of making money. Any money God cannot give us, we don't need it. Any money God cannot give us, we don't need it. Let that money go to perish. So it's so important to come to that point. This is what he's saying. He said, pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. What should you pursue here? Righteousness. Because anytime you're not pursuing righteousness, what happens is you begin to pursue unrighteousness. So you need to pursue what? Righteousness. What should you pursue? Righteousness. And like I said, as a righteousness is making money the right way. It's a godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Each of those words have a strong meaning in this conversation, in the context of this conversation. All right? He said, pursue what? Righteousness. That's being right. We have been made right with God through Jesus Christ. Leave it out. He says what? Godliness. That means your choices are godly. Even when it comes to money. He says faith. That means your approach to money. I did some teachings on this on YouTube. See, he said your approach to money should be an approach of faith. Not an approach, you know, not an approach that is so fleshy. Every time you get in the flesh to pursue money, you will punish your spouse, I bet you. Because you will do something that is not consistent with the faith of God. Alright? It is love. Hmm. Imagine responding to your partner in love, notwithstanding how much you have or don't have. Love. Is it pursue love? Alright? Is it endurance? Uh -huh. It's when you don't have sometimes. It's okay not to have all the time. I'm telling you. Why? He didn't promise us we will not have challenges, but he promised us we will always have victory. Right, and the last one he says is gentleness. Are you seeing all the wonderful, powerful characteristics that he's given us to pursue? Because when we pursue this, our life and our love life will work, notwithstanding the issues of money. All right, and what does he say? He says, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. All I'm explaining is the good fight. Why? He says, should anybody serve as a deacon or a pastor or a minister? He says, should be a man of one wife able to keep his own home. If you can't do these things, you can't keep a home. Money will control you and damage you. See, some of us need to begin to deal with greed. And for some single people watching me or the Lord are listening, I, I tell you the truth, I lie not. Some of us need to stop seeking alternatives that are sinful. Alternatives that are sinful. If not, you can't build the right life. You need to stop seeking alternatives that are sinful. Fight the good fight. Fighting sometimes means going hungry and being fine. Trusting in the Lord and counting him to be your source. Fight the good fight. He said, take hold on eternal life to which you were called when you made the confession in the presence of many brethren. I'm so excited. I'm so excited that I was able to go this far today and make some of this conversation. And I, I just trust. I just trust by the might of the Lord. I just trust by the might of the Lord that we get this right. It will help us. It will help us. Let us pray today. Thank you, Lord Jesus.